Today I'm talking about emotional trauma. We are becoming aware of how widespread trauma is. We're seeing more and more in the papers of it as days go by. And we're becoming aware of the very destructive impact that it has on both our minds and our bodies and our ways of being. We're also beginning to become aware of the impact it's got on our wider communities because it affects how we interact with each other, how we parent children, how we interact in our marriages, <coughs> um, how we interact at, at work. But there's also a lot of confusion about what trauma is. And that confusion gets in the way of, of us being able to heal it. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is, is clarify some of that confusion. <coughs> but, but first I'd like to give you a little bit of my background so that you know where, where I'm coming from and where the book came from. Is it? It's a lively talk centered around the book. 15 years ago, I began to explore my internal world, my emotions, my deeply held beliefs. Um, when I'd lived in the external world and the day-to-day -day had been really rich, I competed horses very seriously as a young rider, I'd got a PhD, I'd lived in Africa, I'd worked for a filmmaker. It'd been fantastic. But what had been going on inside, in terms of my emotional life, and my feelings had been much, much more difficult and painful. And I kind of got to the stage where I really didn't want to keep going like that. And I knew that if I was going to make any differences to myself, I had to really explore what I carried inside me. So I began a process of psychotherapy. And I also went to a lot of workshops, and having done, been an academic, I also read and studied myself. The main changes that happened to me happened through the psychotherapy process. But there was a lot that I learned through reading, through studying, through going through workshops that made a difference. It helped me to see myself differently, to see myself with more compassion, to understand why I was the way that I was. And I wanted to try and share some of that understanding um, in a way that would be accessible to a wider range of people. Often when people write about this, the professionals who write about this, mostly write for other professionals. Not always, but mostly. And it's quite difficult and quite dense writing. So I wanted to try and make some of the insights that have been so important for me accessible to people who were trying to understand their own trauma, to parents, to teachers, to social workers. And also, because I cover quite a wide range of perspectives, also to mental health professionals, people who do help others. To return to where I started, there's confusion about trauma. And that confusion really starts with how we define trauma. In popular culture, the press seems to understand trauma as being the victim of harm. That's right, something harmful happens to us. But it also focuses on trauma being in that harmful experience per se. That's a misconception. The word trauma means a wound, a shock, or an injury. So trauma does not reside in those harmful experiences per se but in their impact on us. So if you take something like 9-11, there were several thousand people in 9-11 who escaped. Of those that got out of the building, only 10%, somewhere between 5 and 15, depending on, on whose figures they are, ended up with post-traumatic stress syndrome. So that means you know, 85 to 95% didn't. It wasn't, the trauma wasn't in the Twin Towers coming down, although that's what cause that had an impact on a certain subset of people which left them with trauma. But it wasn't the Twin Towers per se, it was in the impact that it had on those people. So when we suffer unbearable pain and fear, and what's unbearable to one person is going to be very different to what's unbearable to another. It'll depend on how old we are, it'll depend on our childhood, it'll depend on our support outside, it will depend on our personality as well. When we suffer pain and fear that's unbearable for us, we develop an unconscious conviction 
that our life is somehow at risk. And in response to that, various systems get activated in our minds and also in our bodies, all of which are a product of tens of thousands of years of evolution, and they're there because they've helped us to survive in life-threatening situations. And once those systems have been activated, we move on to a different pathway to the one that we were traveling on before. There's changes that happen in our body, in our hormone, in the way the nervous system connects in the brain, which the middle lot of interviewees in the book talk about, that move us onto a different pathway. And once we're on this pathway, we're in living in a different reality. It's like we've gone through the cupboard into Narnia, although our Narnia is now one defined by trauma. Our reality is different. I've called this altered reality a trauma world. And it's really entry into this trauma world that defines trauma, not those external events that happened around us. So what constitutes a tra trauma world? Well, that varies from individual to individual. Again, it depends on our personality, on our unique experiences, on what's happening around us. But there's three systems that characterize all trauma worlds. Firstly, we perceive the world through a veil of fear. We're always slightly anxious. There's always slightly on the lookout for danger. We're not aware that's happened. We've moved into this trauma narnia. It's just our reality now. We're always slightly anxious. <coughs> There's a tendency to disconnect from parts of ourselves. I'll talk more about this later. But there is a tendency to fragment in some way. And thirdly, our identity becomes interwoven with shame. Shame is an emotion. It's a bit like embarrassment, but embarrassment is a very minor, fleeting, soft form of shame. With embarrassment, we want to hide and disappear for that moment. With shame, we have this fundamental sense that there's something wrong with who we are as a person, that we're somehow inadequate as a human being. I'm going to come back to these three in a minute, and they'll, they'll form the middle of the talk. But what I want to say now is that, is that fear, dissociation, disconnection, and shame, they distort and they twist how we relate to ourselves. We start relating to ourselves differently, and they obviously have an effect and distort how we relate to other people. And if it happens in childhood, if these systems get built up when we're kids, we don't know that things have been changed. This is our normality. This is all we know. And we can't see what we're living. I also need to say there isn't a conscious decision to get these systems activated, to enter this trauma world. It's what human brains and bodies have evolved to do over hundreds of thousands of years in order to survive. We don't decide to do it. In fact, some of these systems go way back before humans to mammals. Um, so they're very old systems, and they're there because they enabled individuals to survive in dangerous, frightening, and painful situations. So what kinds of experiences might create a trauma world in individuals that, that are vulnerable at that time? Well, the most obvious are overt abuse and neglect, what we're hearing a lot about now in the papers also no longer under the carpet, what's coming to life, with a lot particularly focused on sexual abuse. Also growing up among war, among violence, or witnessing atrocities. However, what people are less aware of, but can be equally damaging, is the chronic pain of growing up when we feel unloved and inadequate. So it might be that our parents, we're a girl and our parents wanted a boy and they could never quite love us because we were the wrong sex for them. Or it might be that we're the result of an unwanted pregnancy, or that we were put up for adoption, or that our parents had us to save their marriage, or just that we felt we were never quite good enough for them. And that leads to a low grade, everyday, grinding, grinding pain 
and also a fear that we might just be abandoned. That is enough to, over time, push us into a trauma world. Infants, actually, and very young children can also be pushed into that state when they've got caregivers, parents, who aren't responsive to them. It might be that the parent's ill, or that the parent's depressed, or they've lost their job, or they're stressed, they don't have social support, don't have enough support around them. They might be carrying trauma themselves. But human infants come with this need, they're terribly helpless. I mean, compared to actually other primates and many other species, our, our infants are incredibly help, helpless. And for most of our evolutionary history, Unless your parent was really well attuned to you and really responsive, your life was genuinely at risk. Where I worked in Tanzania, 40% of kids died before they were 15, and 30% of those died in the first five years. That's probably the figures that it's been for most of human history. So a child that's born today doesn't know it's been born in the West in 2016 and that actually it's, it's going to survive. <coughs> We have this long history that's written into us um, <coughs> that if we're not getting that care we need, it's literally life-threatening. Of course it's not conscious. Babies don't consciously think of that. They don't have that. But it goes in their body. The world is frightening. It's already a dangerous place. <coughs> Sometimes the original traumatizing experiences happen to our parents and to our grandparents rather than to us. I and mean, then it's their fears and their distorted way of seeing the world, which gets passed on to us. <coughs> we can't help that. My mother was a Holocaust refugee. She left Poland on the third day of Hitler's invasion, bribed their way out of the border, and did get to safety. But she was a young child, and she was left with a conviction that the world was not safe, that at any minute it could turn on you. <coughs> that things could become dangerous. And that was her reality. And so she interacted with me, and as a child, picked up on the news in ways that told me that that was the reality, that was what was happening. And I carry that from her. It's not pain and fear per se that create trauma. We now know that suffering pain and fear and have been alone with it is what really pushes people into a trauma world. If we've got someone where we can take the pain and fear, somebody that we can talk to and get some kind of help with it. Um, it could be a big sister, I mean, it could be anyone, but if we have, we tend not to end up traumatized. But it's where we don't have that, that we end up traumatized. And again, an evolutionary perspective helps us understand why. If you think about living out in the African plains, whereas I keep saying we spent 99% of the time that we've existed for, we're actually, as individuals, against you know, a pride of lions, not very good at anything. We don't run particularly fast. We don't have claws. We don't have big teeth. We're not that strong. So you, know, you could be a 20-year-old young man who's you know, really fit and really healthy. You were out there for four days on your own, I think you'd be dead at the end of it. You'd have become lion food. What's made humans so successful is the way that we live in groups, is our social relationships, is the support, community, um, and that's what's enabled us to do so well. And, and it actually is, that's also become part of our biology. So when we're alone, our fear system is automatically turned up, we're more alert to fear than when we're with other people. And really, you know, unthreatening situations in a cinema, if you measure people's cortisol, you measure the fear that's going on. If you go to the, somebody goes to cinema alone, they're going to be more activated fear system than if they're there with a friend. So I think when we suffer pain and fear, and we're alone with it, the fear gets really exacerbated. And we can't then work with it, and that pushes us into trauma. Moving on to the systems that are at the core of a trauma world, I'm going to begin by talking about fear. Our first response <coughs> to being emotionally wounded, to, to suffering that kind of pain, 
As I keep saying, is that our minds and our bodies become extremely sensitive to potential danger. And we've evolved to do that. If we're in a, living in a world where there's a lot of predators, or there's very hostile neighboring groups, or our parents don't have the resources for us, and they have to abandon one child in order to keep other children alive. If we're living in a dangerous world, we've got to be more The more sensitive we are to potential danger, the more likely we are to survive. There are costs to living with this more hypersensitive fear system. There's more cost to having turned that up, the volume up on the fear system. We're likely to suffer from anxiety. We're going to perceive the world as dangerous. And we see threats where none exist. So, you know, what are you looking at? And suddenly I've got a situation here when actually they weren't looking at anything. But because I'm looking for danger, you know, a flick of the eyes, and suddenly I see it, and now I'm in a fight. When we're spending lots of time and energy looking for danger, we actually have less energy to be able to put into relaxing, into being creative, into socialising, into the things that really would bring meaning into our lives. Also, that greater looking out for danger, that, that hyper-fear system, comes through changes that happen in our hormones. It changes that happen in our cortisol and in the various hormonal systems, our stress systems, that I think a lot of us have heard quite a lot about. And a big problem with that is that that then affects our immune system. And it makes us more likely to suffer from autoimmune diseases, cancer, heart diseases, a whole host of diseases. So there's a huge amount of cost whoops, I to having this extremely sensitive fear system. There's a lot of cost, but if we're living in a dangerous world, that's the lesser of two evils. It's going to keep us alive. Um, and this, the bit I've been talking about is the bit that obviously comes from all the evolutionary interviewees in the book. It's, it's summarising and putting that together. We become particularly sensitive around the original traumatising experiences. At the heart of a trauma world is this absolutely determined cry of never again will I be re-traumatised. The problem is, is because we're unconscious, it's not a conscious thing. It's unconscious, it's in our bodies, it's in our behaviours, in our immediate reactions. And it can cause as much problem as the original trauma did. So, you know, it may be that we were abandoned as a child. Well, we're never really going to give ourselves to a relationship because actually, if we do, we might risk being abandoned again. Or, um, it may be that we're going to sabotage an opportunity because we were told we weren't bright enough as children because we were just <coughs> or wherever it was. And so then we're not going to put ourselves forward because we're terrified of being told that we're not bright enough again. And it limits our lives in, in a really profound way. It also leaves us with a kind of need to become control freaks in a desperation to stop ourselves getting into a situation where we might be hurt again. We're going to try and control everything around us. Again, it's not conscious, but we're going to try and control our environment, and most of all, we're going to try and control other people. We might do that by criticising them, by making them, trying to make them feel small and inadequate so they won't attack us. We might feel, try and control them through violence, through aggression. But we can also try and control people by playing the victim, you know, don't, don't abandon me, it's poor, you know, you can't hurt me. Or actually, one of the interviewees, Marion Woodman, talks about how we can be very nice to somebody, we're not going to challenge them, because actually we're desperate that they don't abandon us or that they don't attack us. And so if we're not going to challenge them, then that's going to prevent that from happening. Irrespective of whether we try to control our situations around us in order to prevent ourselves from being re-traumatised, irrespective of whether we do that, 
through aggression and violence, or whether we do that through being a victim and through being hyper nice, it contaminates our relationships with other people because they're not free to be themselves. And it also contaminates our relationships with ourselves because somewhere inside we know that actually we're not really being very real and honest in our relationships. It also creates new layers of fear because now we're not just frightened of being re-traumatised, we're now frightened of losing control. Um, I want to say that it's really important to be aware that that fear is as much in our bodies as in our minds. Tina Stromsted, one of the interviewees, talks about this. But, you know, imagine that you're a small child in a playground and you're being bullied. And you learn that if you stick your chest out really, you know, forward and you make yourself as big as possible, that actually the bullying stops. Or you're being attacked at home. Um, and if you make yourself really small and, and kind of withdrawn, you avoid being attacked. If that is happening in your daily level, you take that on into your body. You grow up with it. It becomes part of how you move. It becomes part of how you are in the world. Tina Stromsted talks about an interviewee who was sexually abused, repeatedly sexually abused as a child. And what they found many years into therapy, but that she was completely frozen around her pelvis. And that also she completely, her arms were very tense, with the hope that one day she'd be strong enough to keep that attacker away. And of course there were huge costs to that. She lived with chronic back pain. She had no idea what was causing it. But the tension around here and the pull on her muscles and her pelvis left her with chronic pain. She also had chronic pain in her shoulders and her neck because the tension up here <coughs> again meant that it was all being held here. So we hold these in our bodies, not just in our defences, we hold in our bodies, not just in our minds. However determined we are to avoid being re-traumatised, sometimes we can't help but get into situations that seem similar to the ones that traumatised us. So where we might be attacked or where we might be abandoned. And in those situations, our old trauma comes back to life, not as a memory of the past. It's not like, oh, this is similar to what happened when I was abused. Oh, this is similar to what happened when I was neglected or attacked. But it comes back as a living, knee-jerk reaction in that moment. I've called these reactions trauma reactions. It's a form of memory, which Daniel Siegel and Alan Shaw, the neurobiology interviewees, talk about in the book. It's a form of memory, and it's the same form of memory that we use when we, to learn to ride a bicycle, or a horse, or something like that. When we get on a bicycle, we don't sit there and think, and it wobbles a bit, we don't sit there and think, oh, I've got to tilt my left hip forward, and my right shoulder back, and I've got to pedal, or whatever. Our, that memory is in our body, and it comes as an immediate reaction. We don't remember back to when we learned to ride that bicycle. But it is a form of memory. It's called implicit memory. And what happens, and the advantage of implicit memory is that it's really fast. So, you know, if you think of the speed at which our memories work, if we're trying to be on a bicycle and remember, do I tip this hip or do I tip that hip? You know, we've fallen off by then, right? The advantage is it happens in that instant. And it's the same as trauma if we're growing up in an environment that's dangerous. We don't want to have to remember what we learned and how to react. We want that reaction to be instantaneous. But the problem is that if we've grown up with trauma and we've had to go to that reaction a lot, it's, it's on a hair trigger. It's you know, incredibly easy for it to be triggered. So the minute something reminds us even the vaguest bit of what happened when we were a child, we're back in that reaction. And it's our reality. Once it's triggered, that's our reality. We don't know that we're living something from the past. We feel that we're living something from now. 
I'm being abandoned now. Look at how she's looking at me. She's going to leave me. He's going to leave me. He's going to criticise me. And of course it creates real problems because we overreact to situations. We are going to um, make our relationships really difficult. Um, we're not responding. We think we're responding to the moment, but we're not. Our response is a response from childhood that's come alive in the moment. The second system that forms part of trauma is disconnection, fragmentation. It can take different forms, but all cut us off from our own reality and from the reality of the situation. We first disconnect during the original traumatizing experiences, when we disconnect from the unbearable pain and fear. So, you know, think about it. You hit your thumb with a hammer. It takes a few seconds or maybe even longer before you actually feel that fear. When I used to invent horses, you know, I could fall off halfway around a cross-country course, get back on, feel absolutely no fear, finish the course, ride reasonably well or as well as I ever rode, and half an hour later, suddenly everything is, you know, really, really in pain. There's stories of in World War I, people being shot and running with broken legs. There's women who haven't had epidurals and childbirth, who after a certain level of pain, say, the pain went away, I was on the ceiling looking down. We disconnect when that pain gets too much. And it's because our brains release opiates in that situation. When pain gets too much, we release opiates, it, acute pain, that, that then um, deadens the pain, numbs the pain. It's still, our body's still damaged, our minds are still <coughs> damaged with trauma, but we're numb to it by the release of opiates. Once we're out of, of danger, if we've got enough support, if we've got people around us, we can begin to process what happened. And at that point, we can come back into our bodies, into our emotions, and we can allow the pain <coughs> and that fear to flow through us, which, if we can really sit with it and we've got support, it does. We often, when we hit, go into pain and we go into fear, there's a feeling it will never pass. But actually, if we sit with it with support, eventually it will move through us. When we don't have support, we can't do that. And so we're left with our pain and fear separated from us. We're left desperately trying to keep it numbed off. Because were it to come to the surface in that unprocessed form, we're not going to be able to get on with everyday life. We're not going to be able to do our jobs. We're not going to be able to parent our kids. We're not going to be able to go to school. If it's absolutely there and raw, and it hasn't been softened through that process of integrating it, then um, we just can't function. Keeping those emotions cut off from us is easier said than done. So there's all, you know, we think we're going to obliterate them, but we don't. They're held in us. And at any kind of situation that seems similar to the one that traumatised us again, they tend to pop out to the surface. So again, we're driven by an imperative to avoid anything that might allow those emotions back into our lives. And again, that limits our lives, because we're not going to do this in case it opens to that emotion. We're not going to do that. It also makes us and could be, make people at risk of, of becoming addicts. Because with addictions as well, it's a way to separate from our pain and fear. Um, separate from our bodies, take us out of that. Certainly when we're in the addictive high, I mean, not necessarily when we come down from it, but in the addictive high, it's a way it gives us respite for that time. <coughs> This kind of dissociation and disconnection that I'm talking about involves cutting ourselves off from that original pain and fear that we were never able to integrate, that was so powerful that we couldn't really process it and that overwhelmed us. There's another form of disconnection that happens with trauma when we disconnect from parts of ourselves. It's because we're afraid that if we express those parts, if we live them, we're going to get attacked right now. Not the past, but now. 
So <coughs> we might cut off our pain and our fear if those were unacceptable in our society to our parents. <coughs> we might just as well, if we come from a Calvinist household, we might be cutting off our joy, not be able to express our joy. We might not be able to express our, we might cut off our vulnerability, our sexuality in certain religions, our intellect, our ambition, our creativity. We can cut off things that have been really positive for our lives if they weren't acceptable. We might cut off our need for love and connection if as a child when we needed love and connection, you know, our parents were like, just get on with it, you know, but I don't have time. And we cut off that need to be connected to people. We grow up and we, our view of ourselves is, oh, I'm really independent, I don't need anyone, I'm happy on my own. But actually, that's come out of this implicit, unconscious need that we had to separate out those parts of ourselves that were so unacceptable. It's not conscious. We don't cut off these parts of ourselves consciously. I mean, we don't say, I'm never going to, you know, do this again, or I'm never going to be angry again. Sometimes we do, but very rarely. Most of the time, it just happens surreptitiously. It happens, you know, as the similar way to how we learn to walk and talk. It just happens, step by step, until that part of us is gone or it's no longer lived. And we build our lives around this kind of half person that we've become. And then life feels somewhat insecure because actually we're not standing on our own ground. We're, you know, we're on one foot. There's only part of us that we're able to live. And we're also frightened. We feel like a fool. We're frightened of being discovered that actually there is this whole part of us that isn't acceptable. So there's fear that that will come out and that we'll be seen for it. There's many ways to bury, disconnect these parts of ourselves. Sometimes we can use self-control and willpower. I will not ever get angry. Sometimes and often we're, we're going to try and criticise ourselves out of it. You, know, you stupid cow for doing that again. Why have you done that again? You're not going to do that again. We have these internal voices that try and criticise us in the hope that if they can be critical enough, then actually we'll stop doing it. The problem with that is when we're criticising ourselves in that way, we're attacking ourselves and we're actually re-traumatising ourselves now. So in a desire to stop ourselves being traumatised by somebody out there, we now become our own traumatisers. We're belittling ourselves, we're attacking ourselves, we're telling ourselves we're not good enough. There's no route to healing, to well-being, when we're doing that to ourselves. Sometimes we disconnect from these parts of ourselves, and often, actually, we disconnect from it unconsciously. We don't know what we're doing. It's gone when we're too young to do it. One of the interviewees, Marion Woodman, tells of discovering a part of herself that she cut off when she was terribly young. She discovered it through a dream. She's a Jungian analyst, so she works with dreams a lot, Marion. So this is just a snippet of, of Marilyn's dream. I go to the attic of my childhood home to find a black box. I put my hand in and feel the quivering warm body of my pet bird. I cry because I have forgotten him and left him alone to die. I'm afraid of what I might see when I take him out of the box. But I do so. As my tears fall on his skeletal body, he turns into a tiny baby and says, I only wanted to sing my song. Marion's parents wanted a boy. They didn't have a name for Marion for the first six weeks because they only had boys' names. And she was never, that part of her, that vulnerable part of her, could never be expressed as a child. And she was in her 50s, 60s before she really went back and recovered and reconnected to that part of herself. We can disconnect from parts of ourselves through our body as well. So imagine that as a child we start crying and your parent says, you know, if you don't stop crying, I'll really give you something to cry about. 
So it wouldn't be long before we'd started to learn to bite our lip and to hold our jaw really tight to stop those tears from coming. And in doing so, we're then disconnecting. It's our body that's holding those parts apart from us. Or if we got very criticised for expressing ourselves, we might end up stuttering in the end because actually it was too dangerous to speak. And so, at some unconscious level, we, we, we stop be, being able to speak, and it's held in our voice, in our throat. Shame is the third system that's part of a trauma <coughs> world. Shame is this absolutely embodied, visceral sense of being fundamentally flawed and inadequate as a human being. We just feel at some very deep and often unconscious level there's something wrong with us. Shame's also relational, so it's often about there's something wrong with me, I'm not worthy of having relationships, meaningful relationships, not necessarily sexual or marriages, but friendships. I'm not worthy of having relationships of any kind with other people. People seem not to like me, whatever it is. Shame is often confused about guilt. We hear a lot about guilt in our culture. Very Before I started this work, I'd never heard of shame. I didn't know what shame was. Um, but they are different. So with guilt, we feel bad about the things that we've done. So I can be a good person who did something bad. With shame, it's about who we are. It's about our identity. It's not about what we've done. It's about something more fundamental about who we are. Shame is, comes through the emotional networks of the brain and the body. So although it's often accompanied with self-critical thoughts like, you know, I'm stupid or I'm useless or I'm fat or whatever our self-critical thoughts are, Ultimately, it's lived as that total experience that kind of lodges underneath thoughts and words. It's the source from where those thoughts and words come, but it's much more than that. And it sucks us into this kind of equivalent of this sort of black hole, of a psychological black hole. Shame's experienced as a passing emotion in everybody. It's evolved to tell us that we're at risk of losing a social relationship. I mustn't do that. That's not good. For somebody to do that. We're such social creatures. We have emotions that specifically evolve to help us in our social relationships. And shame is one of those. And when shame passes through us and it comes and it goes, it's very important. It gives us very important information about how we need to relate to other people. But with trauma, Shame becomes an enduring part of our identity. It doesn't pass through us. It becomes absolutely lodged in who we are. And then we become shame-based. There's several routes to becoming shame-based. We can be shamed by others. We can always, you know, our parents somehow were never quite good <coughs> enough. There's something wrong with who we are or not. Pretty enough, or thin enough, or good enough at sports, or good enough at school, or whatever it is. We always fall below their expectations. We're just not good enough. It can come to us through overtly being criticised, told, you know, you're useless, you know, wish I'd never had you, or whatever it is. It can come much more implicitly. When we're being shamed by others, it's actually can be the original wound that traumatised us. It can be that chronic, but continually being shamed, it's enough to send us into a trauma world. So it's part of a trauma world, but it can also be the, the catalyst that sends us into a trauma world. Infants actually develop shame when they've got parents who aren't responsive to them. So human infants have this desperate need to be looked after, and they come into the world with an expectation that they will. And so when parents can't be responsive to them, there's not a, it's not conscious, they don't have the words and the language for it, but they grow up with this sense of, there's something wrong with me because I'm not being looked after as I should be being looked after. There's also a sense 
that there's something wrong with our needs for actually needing to be looked after in that way. So we get shame around our needs. I'm, I'm wrong because I need love or because I need support or because I need help. And that kind of comes in very under the radar. And it comes in not through words. It comes in through kind of our emotional self, our way of being, long before we even have words. We can also develop shame in situations that happen that have absolutely nothing to do with us. But because we're des so let's say our parents divorce or um, a parent gets ill and dies. You know, it's classic that kids end up thinking, must be something wrong with me. If I'd been a better child, they'd have stayed together. Or if I'd done something differently, my mother wouldn't just have <coughs> cancer. Or whatever it is. And that form of shame comes because we're desperate to try and work out why this bad thing has happened. And the simplest answer is to think, it must be my fault. Um, it's not often not the right answer, but it, but it is the simplest answer. I've just read a book by a guy called James Rhodes, um, who was repeatedly raped by his gym master at school. And when he finally braved somebody, braved it to tell He'd done some therapy, but when he finally braved it to tell one of his, his sort of friends of his family, the response was, well, you were a very pretty boy. So it was as though it was his fault for being pretty that he'd been repeatedly raped. So it's not just in us that that reaction must be that it's something to do with you. It's one that goes through um, <coughs> society too. We can also become shame-based in response to our behaviour once we've entered a trauma world. So if we're being controlling of other people, if we're using aggression, or we've got an addiction, or we're, whatever it is, however we're behaving, we're overreacting with our fear response. We're getting kind of, you know, punchy. And when we come out of it, or, you know, we wake up the next morning with our hangover, or whatever it is, there's that sense of, yes, I really am inadequate. It just proves it. Look, I'm drunk again. Or, you know, I've got aggressive again. Irrespective of how shame enters us, irrespective of how it becomes part of our sense of who we are at some fundamental level, once we become shame-based, it's really almost impossible to see that shame for what it is. We're just convinced this is the reality. There's something wrong with me. And so we see ourselves through these distorted lens. And actually, we see ourselves with contempt. You know, I'm an inadequate human being. And we feel a victim to our own supposed inadequacy. And that creates a vicious spiral of shame. So we're going to become ever more desperate to try and get rid of whatever part of ourselves we think makes us inadequate. Ever more desperate to disconnect from that. Um, and at the same time, we become ever more desperate to be successful. Because we think if we can be successful, if only we can win that Olympic gold or become partner in a law firm or get the bigger house or get a new car, that somehow we won't be inadequate, we won't feel inadequate after all. But the reality is, as if we're shame-based, then no amount of external success is actually going to make a difference. It'll make a temporary difference for you know a short period of what time. But if there's a fundamental belief that we're inadequate, then those external achievements aren't really going to make a dent on it always come back in the end to that feeling of there's something unworthy about who we are. We're going to have to work with shame directly to heal it. You can't sort of bypass it through being successful. Shame also poisons our relationships with other people. We're terrified that if they really get to see us, we try to hide the fact that we're inadequate. We don't want other people to think of us that way. So we try to hide it. And we're terrified that if they get close to us or they might see us as that inadequate person that we believe that we are. And so we push up barriers, and we push them away, we might sabotage relationships, we might not get into relationships. 
Or we might, circling back to the earlier theme, will e become even more determined to try and control them so that they don't actually see us or respond to us in that way. But of course, all that does is it leaves us with this feeling that our relationships aren't really nourishing. They don't really have trust. There's no real intimacy in our relationships. And that creates a greater sense of isolation, which, as I was trying to say at the beginning, then makes us more frightened because we're now alone. And also, because humans <coughs> are so social, because we need other people so desperately, when we don't have close, really trusting relationships and friendships, we doubles that belief that there's something wrong with who I am, because actually other people seem to have these friendships and relationships that work. And what's wrong with me that I feel that I don't have them? So that exacerbates shame. So coming now to the last section, how can we heal trauma? The challenge in healing trauma is that trauma worlds are self-perpetuating. As we've seen, you know, shame creates more fear, fear of being seen by others. It creates isolation. It makes us want to disconnect. Disconnecting from ourselves creates fear. These worlds sort of start feeding in on themselves once these systems get going. Also, these systems become so much part of who we are that we can't recognize them. We can't see them. It's, it's just too... You know, it's, it's like, I'll go back to riding because this is a place where I did a lot of riding. But, you know, when you're on a horse, you can't see what you're doing. I sit in a, I need someone else to point it out. That's just how I sit on a horse. I'm sitting lopsided. I'm not aware of that. That's, you know, I have a broken collarbone. That's just the way I sit. I can't get outside of myself to see that for myself. So struggling to see the trauma world for what it is, we as a society, actually as a society as well as as individuals, we tend to focus on the symptoms of trauma. So we might focus on anxiety, we might focus on shame of feeling inadequate, we might focus on addiction, um, rage, Depression can also be a consequence of trauma. We might focus on the fact that we're struggling in our relationships, or that we've got physical ailments, that our back and our neck and is so tight. <coughs> and we're going to put energy and resources into trying to alleviate those symptoms. We might do that through short-term therapy. That's what's offered um, in the NHS these days, through psychotherapeutic drugs, through hopefully getting a new relationship, maybe that'll make everything okay. A new job, maybe if I finally lose weight, it'll all be fine. Whatever it is, we go for these things that we think are going to give us some kind of respite. And they do, they give us a temporary respite. But actually, we haven't changed the underlying trauma. And so in time, we're going to fall back into our suffering. It's like we're weeding a garden and we've top, taken the tops off the weeds. We haven't gone and got the roots underneath. It won't be, you know, yes, for a while, we'll have a weed-free garden and it'll look great. But it won't be long before those weeds start growing again because we haven't got to the roots. Even when we can see our underlying trauma, we often don't recognise the trauma world that was created around us. So we might see that that event traumatised us, that we were sexually abused or that we were abandoned or whatever it was, but we won't see what grew up around that. And then our first port of call is to blame whoever or whatever caused those wounds in the first place, caused that damage, and to look for retribution. We're seeing it all over the papers now with all the sexual abuse cases that are coming up. And it is a valuable first step. We do need to recognise what happened to us. We do need to validate that it wasn't okay. It wasn't our fault. This person should not have done it to us. We need to send out a message to society that no, it is not okay to behave in this way. That is all very important. 
but focusing on those traumatizing experiences and on punishing the perpetrators won't bring us lasting healing because it can't change the systems that we've developed around those experiences. It can't change our trauma world. So it's a bit like we get hit by a drunken driver and our leg gets broken. Focusing on understanding the accident and on catching and then jailing the driver is great, it's important, but it's not going to heal our leg. If we're going to heal our leg, we have to work with our leg. We have to go to a doctor who can help put the bones back together, and then we have to do the physiotherapy and the massage and the daily work to learn how to reuse that leg again ourselves. Jailing the driver doesn't do any of that for us. It's hard work. It's a pain in the neck. It wasn't our fault. We got traumatised. But somehow, if we're going to get out of it, we have to do that. So to really heal trauma at a deeper level, we have to have the courage to recognise that ultimately our lives are compromised, not by those experiences themselves, but by the impact they had on us, by the trauma world that was created in our own minds, in our own bodies. And we have to realise that without judging ourselves negatively for it, without criticising ourselves for it. That is what human beings over tens of thousands of years have evolved to do in the case of a lot of pain and fear. It's part of being human. At the same time, we can't just sit there and say, oh, well, it's part of being human, that's fine, I'm just going to stay like this. Because, you know, it's going to be a very tough life if we do that. So at the same time, we have to take responsibility for transforming our trauma worlds, like we have to take responsibility for doing the physio and the exercises if we want to ever be really active, having had our leg broken. We have to take that responsibility. So what does it mean to take responsibility for finding our way out of a trauma world? A cognitive awareness of what happened to us and actually of the systems that got put up in their place, of the fear, of the disconnection, of the shame. It's a start, but it's not enough. When our emotions get really aroused, when our trauma is triggered, when it comes to life again, what we know cognitively doesn't have any effect on it. So, you know, cognitively I knew I was not going to get killed tonight. I might be attacked in the questions, but I was basically going to come out of here with my life. You wouldn't have thought so from what has been going on in my body today, right? <laughs> my head can tell my body as much as I like that it was going to be fine tonight. My body was like, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm in my own reality here. Cognitively, what I knew didn't make any impact on what was happening at that emotional level. So cognitive can only go so far. It can be a start, but it can only go so far. If we're going to really heal trauma, we've got to enter into those emotions. We've got to work with them directly. And the first thing we have to do, we've got to reconnect to that original pain and fear that was too difficult for us to bear when we were younger. We've got to learn how to tolerate it. It's incredibly challenging. We have to do it little bit by little bit. It takes time. It's like running a marathon. You try and run 26 miles in one go, you're going to end up injured. You run a mile, and next week you run two miles, and the week after that you run three miles. And if you give yourself enough time, you get up to the marathon. We have to approach a little bit of that fear and pain, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. But it's only once we learn how to tolerate it. You know, we've kept it, we've kept ourselves separate from it. We've kept it down here. We've kept it hidden in, in our shoulder, in our unconscious. Wherever we've kept it hidden, in our pelvis, in our arms. And it's only by learning that actually now we're adults. Now we have a support system. Now we've got people who can help us be with it. It's only by once we start learning that actually we can bear it, 
that we, our lives are no longer driven by that need to avoid it. We also have to engage with the, with the fear and the disconnection and the shame that form our trauma worlds. They don't disappear, they don't dismantle by themselves. We've got to work with them directly, and that actually means we've got to feel them in our body, not just go, oh yes, well, you know, I feel inadequate and I'm going to work with feeling inadequate and tell myself how wonderful I am. We have to actually feel, become aware of what it feels like when that comes over us. And then we have to challenge that. So we have to risk showing ourselves to another person, showing what we think is so inadequate about us to somebody else. And obviously that other person has to be somebody who's compassionate enough and awake enough and conscious enough to be able to receive us in that way. That's what heals shame. You know, um, and it's a huge risk because if we open ourselves to the wrong person and they criticise us and shame us again, we're going to be re-traumatised. And it feels terrifying. So again, it's a slow process. Similarly, we have to disconnect to those parts of ourselves we've abandoned. So it's really frightening if we've spent our whole life not being angry and suddenly we express our anger. You know, there's terror that we're going to be annihilated for this. But we have to live it in that way. It's the only way to heal. And it's, you know, it's like wanting a new garden. We could sit in our lovely warm sitting rooms and think, yes, I'd like a flower bed here, and I'd like some trees there, and it'd be really nice if the lawn was better here. But actually, sitting here talking about it, planning it, looking out of the window at it, doesn't change our garden. We want to change our garden, we've got to get out there, we've got to get down on our hands and knees, we've got to get dirt under our nails, we've got to do the hard work to create a new growth that we want. It's the same with trauma. We don't only have to get to know what we carry from the past to transform trauma. We do need new experiences. We need new learning. We need to learn new ways to be. And learning happens in the present moment through new experiences. You know, we don't learn about driving a car by somebody telling us how to drive a car. We have to get in a car to learn to drive it. If our traumas come, if it's emotional, it's come from our relationships, we actually have to have healthy, healing, professional relationships in order to learn new ways of being. So that brings me to one of the last points. We can't heal trauma alone. That need for new experiences is one of the many reasons why we need to work with somebody. We need to expose ourselves of where we think we're most inadequate and have them receive us. We can't, it's just not possible to do that alone. We need support if we're going to approach that fear and that pain that was just too much for us to bear as kids. We can't do that alone. We need guidance if we're going to try and dismantle our trauma worlds. That healing relationship can come from a variety of people. You can get it from a therapist, a counsellor, a teacher, a social worker, a healing group, a priest. Doesn't matter who provides that relationship. What matters is the person who's providing it understands trauma themselves and that they've lived it and there's various neurobiological reasons why that. Healing trauma is a bit like learning a language like Chinese. It's not enough to have the, you know, that our teacher can recognise the characters when they're written down on a page and that she knows the grammar. She has to be able to speak that language if we're going to learn to speak it. It's the same with trauma. <coughs> So, if we carry trauma, what does it mean to be healed? When we embark on trying to heal trauma, we typically imagine we'll reach a place where our lives are free from that pain and fear that's been so there for us for so long. We typically think we'll get to a place where the trauma no longer has any effect on our lives. 
When I started therapy, I went in with this list of I want this sorted, this sorted, this sorted, this sorted, and I never want to have to deal with any of them ever again. You know, I just look at it and I love, I mean, it'd be great, it would have been great, but it's not reality. We can't change the past. It's with us. It's the same physically. I broke my collarbone 30 years ago falling off a horse. It never healed. It's in two pieces. I will always have a broken collarbone. But I've learned to reduce its impact on me. So these muscles round here now support my shoulder. There's certain things I can't do. I can't sleep on this side. I mean, there are certain limitations because I have this break here. But I know how to work with those limitations. I know how to work with them in a way that doesn't compromise my life. It's the same with trauma. It's the same with those emotional, psychological limitations that come with us. They never go away. Our wounds remain part of us. However, what can be changed is their impact. They don't need to affect us in the same way. To achieve that, we have to go inside ourselves, we have to go into our feelings, we have to get dirty in the garden, and we have to find new and healthier ways of being with the pain and the fear that was originally too much for us, that was originally unbearable. And as importantly, we have to transform our trauma ones. We have to transform that fear, the disconnection, and the shame. It is a challenging process. It takes time. Many people and our public health services and the government are looking for faster, easier, cheaper routes. There is no easy and quick route. To heal, we've got to commit ourselves to the challenge. And it's really important we make the commitment, not only to help ourselves, but because when we carry unprocessed trauma, we have no choice but to relate to other people through this haze of fear, disconnection, and of shame. To relate to our children that way, to relate to our neighbours, our colleagues, our family. And when we do that, we're behaving in ways that might just push them into their own trauma worlds. In contrast, when we transform our trauma worlds, when we break that spiral, we start relating to ourselves and to other people in much healthier and much more nourishing ways. Thank you. Thank you.